Well, everybody here has experienced firsthand a number of times how quickly the world is changing. You know, this has always been the case. And in the last 15, 20 years uh, or more, I've been working in the innovation space. Uh, it's been about change. And sometimes that's radical, sometimes it's disruptive. But I think we're at a whole other level of understanding about the pace of change and how that can impact every facet of life uh, and business. And so you know, let's just look at some of the ways over the last couple of years, this world has changed, uh, arguably never going back to the same way it was before. Uh, some extreme stats, the, this depression or recession, I <laughs> better not uh, call it a depression yet, it's the deepest since the end of World War II. In 2024, the Brookings Institute estimates that the world GDP will be 3% below a no COVID scenario. So if there was not a COVID, uh, we'd be 3% higher. For low income countries, hit especially hard, 6%. Up to 8, up to 18% of worldwide gross domestic product could be wiped out by 2050 if global, global temperature rises three degrees Celsius. Uh, that is significant to say the least, 18%. And Looking a little more specifically uh, at industry, semiconductor chip shortage that no doubt you've heard of is expected to cost the global automotive industry at least $210 billion. That was recently revised and increased. We're definitely living in a VUCA world. And if you haven't seen this acronym, I certainly understand. But once you're familiar with it, you won't forget it, I promise. The environment that we are in today, all of us personally, uh, through business, uh, politically, it's volatile, it's very uncertain, it's complex and it's ambiguous. So what does that mean? Looking at volatile, if you ever took chemistry class or, or watched different uh, compounds, uh, gases combined to make an explosion, uh, that's volatile, highly volatile. Just a couple things could happen and suddenly major disruption. It's uncertain. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen next. Uh, perhaps you're driving down the road, you can think of it that way. You come to some fog, you can't see very well, not quite sure if the road goes to the right. Does it go to the left? Is there an animal in the way? You don't even know if there's actually a road anymore. Maybe the bridge is out. Completely uncertain. Complexity. So many moving parts and pieces. You think about the global impact. Something happens in China uh, and the whole world starts to realize. Something uh, happens uh, in South America and everybody is uh, affecting the, uh, uh, feeling the change. And ambiguous, not quite sure what's gonna happen. Uh, if in a chess game, it's complex, but you at least know what the rules are. Ambiguous scenarios, which we find ourselves in, you're not sure what the question is, what the game is, let alone what the answer in the next move is. Put this together, any one of which would be difficult, but put it all together, and that is quite profound. Incidentally, this uh, was coined by a military, uh, US military describing uh, the change in warfare and how guerrilla warfare in particular, where you don't know who the enemy is, where they're at, how they're going to strike you, how many they are, where they're going to strike you at, uh, is all unknown. That's a VUCA environment. So I think it's quite telling that we have to go to something that extreme from military to find something adequate enough to talk about the world we're living in. A couple other stats, just talking about that pace of change. So half of the S&P 500 in the U.S. here will be replaced in the next 10 years. Uh, and I've got some questions for you guys from time to time. It's very easy in an uh, in-person environment to, to spot you and ask questions. But I ask that uh, when I ask a question, if you've got an answer, I would love to hear it. Just unmute for a second. I'll pause when I do that. So average lifespan on the S&P 500. This is companies uh, in 1955. On average, how long do you think that they existed on the S&P 500? Somebody jump in there for me, who's willing? 40 years. 40 years, pretty darn close, 33 years. That's a whole generation, right? I mean, okay, we're, we're doing well. On average, you can expect 30 years or so, a third of a, a century will be okay. Fast forward to today, what is the estimate that uh, we're at now for the average lifespan? Who wants to take a guess? Ten years. Five years. Less. Ten years. Five years. 
Very close, 18 years, and it fluctuates actually 13 years to 20 years and estimated to be around that. That's a dramatic shift. If, if you are expecting 33 years and that was the life that, that was indicative of a lot of strategic planning that enabled when you had that kind of longevity, 18 years, much shorter lifespan, there's much more disruption and change hitting the uh, hitting industry. And it's not any one industry is sheltered. It's sure in, in certain years, uh, one industry, healthcare perhaps is, is being hit harder by others, but it's across the board. Um, I love this. The number of years it took for the top five hotel chains in the world globally to reach 4 million rooms. I'll share uh, this one with you. It took 387 combined years to build enough rooms uh, to reach 4 million rooms. That's a hell of a lot of uh, rooms, so it's understandable it took a while. How about for Airbnb? How long did it take them, how many years, to get to 4 million rooms worldwide? Two. Who's willing to guess? Three years. <laughs> there we go, nine years. You know, I wouldn't be surprised at two. And what's next? What's going to come and disrupt and, and enable uh, an even more rapid change um, within a shorter period of time? So check back in two years. I'm sure things will be different, even if it's not another nine years. So rapid change is happening across the industry. And companies are realizing that they need to innovate. They can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. So today, we're talking about innovation. It's a word that's used so much. We should probably step back and say, well, what exactly is innovation? And uh, being a little bit difficult on Zoom, I won't fully ask the question, but often when I ask what is uh, innovation, um, what is an example of an innovative company or innovations, and I'm sure these come to mind for, for you, at least some of these, uh, we say Apple, uh, Tesla, Airbnb, Spotify. Yeah, those are probably in the top 20, 30 list of anyone were to ask you which uh, the most innovative companies. Well, let's let's get back to that. Uh, let's go uh, look at some history to better understand innovation and what it actually might be. What do these three people have in common? First, who are these people? Name any one of them that you recognize. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, good. I'd be I'd be worried if nobody uh, could could ID him, right? Uh, Thomas any guesses Ford, for the other Edison two? And Henry Ford. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, great. So besides being old white gringos or old gringos, they also have in common that they are known. Uh, sorry, and Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Steve Jobs, indeed, they are known for inventions they didn't create. We go back here, Thomas Edison, even in textbooks today, when my daughter was a little younger in uh, junior high, Thomas Edison was written on the page for inventing the light bulb. Did not invent the light bulb. Yes, took it forward, but did not invent the light bulb. Henry Ford, often known for uh, the, the assembly line and, and making that happen. Rightly so, is known for it, but did not invent it. And Steve Jobs, all of those products, while interesting, unique, disruptive, uh, incredibly uh, valued by, by customers worldwide, none of that was actually new. It was not the first to, to market in any of that thing. Henry Ford, Ford summed it up well. I invented nothing new. I simply assembled into a car the discoveries of other men behind who were centuries of work. He goes on to say, if I had come 15 minutes, uh, 15 years, or even just 10 years earlier, I could not have done what I do. And, and he tells the story of how from Detroit crossed over Michigan uh, to get to Chicago and the meatpacking industry there, the warehouses, walked inside, saw how there was a cow on one side and prepared meat ready for cooking and shipped to, uh, sent to restaurants on the other side and said, if they can do that with cows, I bet we can do it for cars. So those are all examples of how we tend to think of innovation as being the idea, the light bulb, the electric car, 
But idea is really just part of it. And often the easiest part, if, if you've had any experience uh, within business, entrepreneurship, coming up with ideas is really important. It can be difficult, but often the most innovation happens with an existing idea and figuring out how to implement it. It's that implementation that is actually really critical. And I tell a lot of my students in, in classes that probably the best place to start if you're wanting to be an entrepreneur, take an interesting idea that has a real customer need, but just isn't being executed well and focus on how do you get that to market cheaply and easily. You're more likely to win than trying to come up and brainstorm entirely new ideas that the planet hasn't seen yet. And so just highlighting back to those four examples, Apple definitely not the first to, to bring in uh, smartphones or any products. Smartphones uh, actually back in 1984, believe it or not, IBM created a smartphone or telephone, text messaging even, and it was actually touch screen. Uh, a side note, you can see how long sometimes it takes for technology to actually be adopted and for companies to, to understand how to get that to market. Uh, Tesla, electric cars, unbeknownst to me until more recently, I knew they existed cent uh, decades ago, but they existed centuries ago, 1800s, late 1800s invented um, and then commercialized actually 1890s. And in New York City, there was a whole fleet of electric taxi cabs that had stations where they would, you would drive in, they would take out the battery and replace it with a new one so the taxi could keep, could keep going, meet the needs of the, the demand there. All that existed. It wasn't until um, lobbying and oil industry won that we did not see electric cars until much later. Um, Airbnb, definitely not the first to, to allow people to stay at someone else's home. That's been going on ever since someone had a home, ever since the couch was invented, there's somebody sleeping on it. A uh, friend, but even just uh, a marketplace for that. Verbo, uh, vacation rental by owner, had been around over 20 years before Airbnb started. And Spotify, uh, Napster might be familiar with that online, uh, allowing um, what was deemed to be piracy, uh, and probably rightly so, being able to download for free uh, all sorts of music from the web. Uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, they actually, in 2006, had a, a, an app for phones as well. So they, Spotify wasn't even the first to do any of that. So all this to say, the idea is important. Understanding a, a good idea that will meet a customer problem, but implementation is so key. But that's what trips companies up. Why is it then that so many companies struggle with implementation? We see time and time again, interesting ideas that they can't get it to market. Well, I would say the biggest issue, the biggest thing stopping companies from being innovative and succeeding, implementation being such a key focus, is culture. Implementation actually requires an entire culture that can think holistically, build creatively, work collaboratively, and learn from mistakes on the fly. You could come up with ideas by having an R&D lab. You could have a studio downtown at the fancy office. And Brilliant folks working and coming up with new technologies. Uh, you can bring in strategists and, and corporate lawyers and, and, and come up with perhaps new strategies, ways to uh, gain more value. But if you really want to innovate, meaning implement those, the whole culture has to be involved. Uh, and today, more than ever, you've got to be able to think holistically, uh, not just one solution, be able to extremely be creative and bring in ideas from all across the company, get different heads in the room together uh, to collaborate and learn, try things, be able to rapidly actually fail and say, aha, now we're one step closer to how it works. All of those things can be extremely difficult for a traditional culture. Uh, no doubt many of you have been in a culture that find those things difficult and are likely struggling um, in the market because of it. We need those skills, but so many companies are lacking those skills. 89% uh, Deloitte found of global companies report they're not prepared to build the organization of the future. We know we need to be different, but how do we actually build that? Well, it's difficult to actually find those skills. 80% of the world CEOs are concerned they don't have the skills necessary um, internally. And then to go out and find those, 60% uh, employers say that Graduates aren't sufficiently trained in the workforce, uh, the skills that they will need to be in the workforce. So 
we don't have we need these skills to be innovative it's difficult to find those and be, get uh training for them through schools well fortunately a lot of the skills that are needed to be innovative to have a culture of innovation are actually basic human skills we've just lost touch with those and we've lost the appreciation of their importance of the importance of being human in the workforce the world economic forum has uh, said well that it's human talent not capital or technology that's the key factor linking innovation competitiveness and growth in the 21st century human talent and the skills that come with that so to innovate companies would actually be far better off building cultures that foster human strength rather than ideating around the latest technology chase, chasing what competitors are doing or trying to implement and borrow the latest uh, business model. So let's look at some of those skills that are intrinsically human that we can cultivate and uh, apply across the organization and become human centered. I'm gonna call out six in particular, a shared purpose. As humans, we wanna know what we're doing has a reason, a purpose behind it. Why are we coming together? And more than ever, I think uh, workers are realizing no, this isn't just a nice to have, this is a must have. Companies can do better and we're seeing a lot of churn. If companies are not engaged and do not buy in that there's actual purpose, they're gonna move somewhere else. A growth mindset, we'll get into all of these in a little more detail, but growth mindset meaning I can try something, I can fail at it, and I don't take that on personally that I am bad. I treat that as a learning and I'm gonna iterate and, and get better. Creative collaboration. We're all naturally creative. If you think back to when you're five or four or six or some even older, uh, you'd bring home something from school you created, right? You'd, your mom would put it on the, on the fridge. Uh, your dad would show it at work. Uh, and you'd go back and you'd be willing to try anything. No doubt if you remember far enough back, you were creative. You weren't scared of, of failing and not, uh, not being creative and, and not having uh, believing in yourself that way. And collaboration, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, the systems that have been built around organizations the last 100 years or so uh, were designed to keep things the same way, in which case you didn't have to collaborate as much. If we're trying to solve new problems uh, and to be innovative, we must collaborate in new ways. There we go. Widespread empathy. The entire organization needs to actually feel what it's like, feel the pain of the customer feel the pain of, of their colleagues in different places, be able to embody that and based off of that empathy, then be able to help uh, have that guide you to come up with the right solution. So the entire company um, being empathic is really important. Also natural as human beings, we have that. Holistic, holistic thinking. Uh, we tend to in work end up in silos. Like I do marketing, I, I don't do this other stuff or I'm engineering, you, you figure out the creative design aspect of it. Uh, and that is that is uh, gotten in the way because the solutions and our customers uh, and the experiences they need are naturally holistic. Nobody says I need marketing in this moment, the next moment I need a design and the following moment I need an actual uh, customer service. It needs to be holistic, solving problems we need to also pull from diverse sources. I don't know why it's doing that. And strategic foresight, thinking about what could be, imagining the future, and actually being strategic about, therefore, what we're going to do in the near future. Let me get into some examples of what I mean by these, um, and then we'll, we'll have some conversations. Uh, actually, I have a couple other examples from COVID days I'll share, but then we'll get into some conversations. So make sure you're taking notes on questions and your own examples and, and experience that you can share. So Vanguard. One of the world's largest invest in investment company has continually outpaced the market do extremely well. Uh, continue year after year growth, um, often beating uh, estimates. Executives attribute that success to their purpose. And that is, you can see here, take a stand for all investors, treat them fairly, give them the best chance for success. Now if that's your purpose. It makes a lot of big decisions much easier as in ownership, who should be owning the company? Well, what's best for the investors? They should own the company. It's completely investor owned, Vanguard is. What about pricing? Well, we should strive to be the industry's lowest, no matter what it takes. And they do indeed have some of the lowest um, 
Okay, so align your strategy and activities around a clear reason to exist. Share that, own that together. Growth mindset, embrace failure with optimism and a focus on learning. Now, I think failure uh, gets a bad rap um, and is, is perhaps used when it shouldn't be. Nobody actually likes to fail. Shouldn't turn to, we shouldn't try and convince people that being a failure is fantastic. And not great. We need to reframe that. We need to focus on learning. What's the best way to learn? Best way to learn is to try something, find out what doesn't work, adjust that learning, and try again. Um, growth mindset, uh, that language comes from a book by Carol Dweck. You might have uh, heard, I think it's called Mindset. Um, if you, if you, if you just look for the mindset book, growth mindset, you will absolutely find it. Uh, and she uses the example of, uh, students that she studied in elementary school. And when they failed a test, uh, some people would be like, see, I'm not good at math. Others would look at that failure and say, okay, I didn't study hard enough, or I need to go get a mentor, or I need to stay after school, or I need to actually spend more time preparing for the test. The difference being that one, it attributes the failure to me as who I am. The other attributes the failure to something in the context. The power there is that I can change my environment. I can change what I do. It's really difficult to change once I believe that's me. And so uh, it's extremely pervasive, the idea of a fixed mindset. A growth mindset is where you need to be able to, uh, to innovate. Um, and so that's where that comes from. Psychological safety is another important um, concept that you should look up if you're not familiar with. Um, Amy Edmondson out of Harvard Business School, I had a chance to meet with her at the faculty lounge. Um, and I'll pose the question to you guys um, that she asked to me, and it really drove home what psychological safety is. So Clinton, uh, let's say you have to get knee surgery, and there are two hospitals you can go to. The first hospital has an error rate of 5%. 5% 5 of the time they screw up, small, sometimes large. Second hospital has a 15% error rate. I mean, three times as much of a chance they're gonna screw something up. Maybe it's minor, maybe it's the wrong leg. Those things happen. You pose the question to me, well, which one would you choose? Like, okay, you fancy uh, Harvard professor. I'm sure this is a trick question, but I'm not gonna go on the record saying I wanna go to the hospital that has the higher error rate. That's ridiculous. But sure enough, like you, like we guessed, it is the 15% error rate. Why is that? Well, it turns out through our studies, she discovered most hospitals have a 15% error rate, and these numbers might vary. The difference is, hospital that publishes 5%, they're probably being accurate. That's how much they know of. But there's 10% of the time, folks are not sharing that knowledge. Let's let's ignore it. Let's hope nobody finds out. Uh, the problem there is that it might be made, a mistake might be made again. So if you go with the 15% error rate, that's a learning culture and our focus being on learning as a critical aspect. So in that scenario, the psychological safety was the environment that let people say, oh man, we screwed up, I screwed up. I cut the wrong leg off or something, which has happened. But what do we do? We learn from that, we're focused on making sure it doesn't happen again. And now if you've ever had uh, surgery, uh, they will actually literally mark up which side of the body it needs to happen on, uh, incidentally. So a, a psychological safety is the environment where you can be fine with messing up, but you're then dedicated to solving it with your team. Google did a study on the highest performing teams. This was many years later that after um, Amy had published work and discovered that the top five reasons their teams are performing, the high performing teams are doing so well, number one, psychological safety. Highly recommend looking that up. Critical when we're talking about iterating, experimenting uh, our way to success um, and being innovative. Creative collaboration, rapidly building, testing, and adjusting ideas in diverse teams. Diverse being critical. We need input, uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing the world, different experiences, different skill sets, different mindsets. Um, Spotify is a good example of how they uh, developed autonomous um, teams, which they call squads, so that those teams have the ability to, uh, to decide what needs to be worked on and go do that without checking in with uh, management, which would delay things. Uh, the, the phrase that they use, kind of the imperative, the design principle, if you will, is loosely coupled, tightly aligned. So the different squads are connected, 
but they are able to iterate. They're able to test something. They're able to uh, prototype and learn and then share that knowledge with someone else, not wait for other teams to be able to do in a sequential order uh, a different revision. So with that foundation of trust and shared vision that Spotify has, they're able to cultivate an environment that is extremely agile, extremely fast, and they're able to put things out in record time, um, meaning ship it to the customers. Airbnb is a good example of customer empathy, and this is all about maintaining company-wide insight into what customers actually need. I, I had a chance to visit with some folks at Airbnb, and a uh, beautiful place, as, as you'd probably imagine, being uh, all about hosting. But what they've done to help remind everybody, uh, all employees throughout the day, that ultimately they're serving guests and they're serving hosts, is that they have designed all of their conference rooms exactly to mimic uh, a site somewhere in the world that you or I could go uh, reserve on Airbnb. So the host locations are built. And so it helps them remember the, what it's like to be a host and it just keeps the product front and central. Also, by staying close to the customers, that customer empathy has, has really cool payoff as far as new products and uh, services and, and features. Um, Sandy was a, a, a massive hurricane that large for hitting New York um, and, and put most of the, the city, at least half of it, underwater. And one of the hosts in New York said, I've got this great idea. And she actually put it up and posted kind of a, a hack to say anybody who doesn't have a home because of the, the floods can come stay here for free. Because Airbnb was in touch and connected with their customers very quickly, they were able to pick up and say, that's a great idea. And we're able to turn that into a feature. So anytime there was a natural disaster, anyone could just click a button as a host and it would turn into and show up in searches that a customer could go and stay there for free. So a, a, a wonderful example of how that can quickly happen if you have empathy for customers and hosts and to reinstill that in the uh, the environment and to remind uh, the employees of that, there's actually posters of the woman who came up with that idea in headquarters um, that everyone passes and reminds them, uh, helps remind them of what they're there for. Strategic foresight. Now this is about tracking emerging forces and adapting your strategy with agility. Quickly seeing something on the horizon, something that's changing, likely to happen, uh, and deciding what to do based off of that. Uh, IKEA is a good example of this. They identified uh, several themes uh, a few years back now, one transient lifestyle, and realized that with folks moving more, and uh, it's even uh, more uh, appropriate today, that perhaps furniture rental was something they should go in. I don't wanna necessarily buy it. I may only be in Lisbon, Portugal for a month, or I may only be here for a little bit. Airbnb works, but I kinda wanna make a place myself for my own, for my own. Uh, Ikea now has uh, furniture rental. Also, just simply being uh, in my own place. I like to switch it up, right? Uh, I can actually rent. I don't have to constantly purchase um, the furniture. Uh, also, when they looked in the fully autonomous lifestyles uh, at cars, they realized that you're really moving from cars to moving living environments. And so maybe that they should offer services uh, and products to help outfit that moving living experience, much like you would your home. Maybe that car is an extension of yourself. Um, or the or the the people the hosts that are owning the car that then are, are renting those out to folks as well. And holistic thinking, exploring all parts of the problem to cause real impact. Costco, in looking at the increase of uh, desire for organic produce, realized that it was kind of difficult to get the prices that they wanted to maintain as being a discount um, wholesale club. And it was also unreliable, uh, the supply chain, how much you could get and when. So they decided they would actually go in and, and find organic suppliers uh, and producers, distributors, and invest in them. And so by thinking through that whole supply chain, they were able to ensure or increase the chances they would be able to keep the, the prices stable, were able to provide the best produce for uh, their, their customers, and continue reaping the benefits, obviously, that that has for the bottom line. So thinking holistically. These are each skills that are based on intrinsically human skills. And to innovate, we need to actually remember those skills and not be looking for the latest technology 
or necessarily entirely new uh, skill sets. We need to look internally and build upon those existing skills as a company and create a culture that fosters that. The real benefit out of all of this uh, can be laid out in, in a few different ways. Um, and and this, these are the great takeaways of why you would wanna focus on being human-centered. Often without uh, a focus, you're running in different directions. Now you're focusing on the right problem. Instead of chasing many different solutions, you're focused on the right problems and the solutions come from that. Instead of repeating the same mistakes over and over, you create a culture of continuous learning growth mindset again, aimlessly choosing the latest tech trends. Instead of doing that, you're now building solutions that solve actual needs. You have empathy for your customers, wasting time fighting internal turf wars. I'm working on that project. You're working on that different project. Stay away. This is my turf. Uh, you actually start to work across silos to increase speed when you have the creative collaboration and understanding of the importance. Uh, and getting blindsided by market changes. Rather, by being able to look out, you can adapt to new opportunities uh, much faster. Um, how are we doing on time? I think maybe I'll just share a couple examples. These are from the early days of COVID. Uh, and I just like the way companies reacted quickly when something so drastic as a pretty much global shutdown was. It's really telling you the type of company it is. Um, Canada sent out a letter containing reassuring and realistic principles for, for remote work. Just really honest and say, you are not working from home. You are at home during a crisis trying to work. I mean, it's just me reading that, even though I wasn't working for Canada, made me feel like, oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. You're acknowledging this is tough. Patagonia, they paused all business, including their online sales, to ensure every one of their employees could be safe, but of course kept paying them. Uh, Patagonia, one of the best examples I've come across about a human-centered organization, and you can look at so many ways they're benefiting from that. Target here in the U.S. Uh, provides 30 days paid leave for frontline employees right off the bat um, in high-risk categories and increases hourly rate by two bucks. And they also decided we're keeping that after things got back, not to normal, but a little more closer to normal. They said that pay raise stays. And so they recognize employees that actually uh, perhaps immunocompromised and were high risk, they're going to pay for them to be safe. Even if I'm not one of those, knowing my employee is taken care of and my actual employer knows about that and cares enough to do that, phenomenal. Uh, Lisa designed and shipped a complete hospital bed kit to hospitals uh, for COVID patients. Uh, they, they, they make beds, but they will spring in and, and create a, a cheap, simple one to send. Uh, Chobani, um, a manufacturer of yogurt, they actually set up a, a cafe to be able a food pantry to hand food out to everybody. Um, and Starbucks provided 20 therapy sessions per year for employees and their families to help cope with the changes. Uh, I think perhaps they should keep that for other reasons. <laughs> Check up unionizing uh, effort, but kudos to them for doing that. Um, and Tata uh, out of India. The chairman took a 20% pay cut to help cover losses due to COVID shutdown and make sure everyone could get paid. So, oh, and one more, Airbnb, 100,000 free lodging to medical workers so they could stay safely from their family. Doesn't that seem like so long ago, but yet it's still similar to today when healthcare workers couldn't go home for uh, fear of infecting uh, their loved ones. Airbnb said, we've got some place, 100,000 free so that you can focus on helping people and not worry about your family members. So that's uh, about innovation, why it's so important, why we need to focus on implementation, yet that's really difficult because it requires a whole culture. And then how we can build a culture around these six core skills that actually build upon human skills. So if we can just be more human, we're much more likely to actually innovate in this rapidly changing world.